Welcome everyone. Kristen, Holly, and I are very excited to be here with you today. So today, as Kyle mentioned, we're gonna be discussing how to dig deep, deeper into dementia without needing a medical degree. Now in the next hour, you're going to discover the first steps to take after receiving a, de a dementia diagnosis. You'll also find out what your care options will be and how you can pay for that care. We'll talk about what good estate planning documents are and why they're vitally important. And then we're also going to talk about how to get access to additional resources and support. This presentation is for you. If you're unsure of what to do once you receive a dementia diagnosis, or if you're confused by what your care might look like in the future, or if you're scared of not being able to make your own decisions at some point, or if you're just sick and tired of feeling alone at this stage of life. Now, imagine you had a compass that told you exactly how to navigate through the second half of life and all the issues that could come up. That would be great, right? This compass would work like a plan, a plan that doesn't burden your families, a plan that protects for your spouse and your loved ones, and a plan that gives you access to other people and resources so that you don't have to go down these roads alone. This is possible. See what our client Patricia Fry had to say. I'm sure glad I made the call. My husband had experienced some health challenges, so we knew it was the right time to put things in order financially to be properly prepared for the future. The thing I most appreciated was that they listened to what we needed and then provided outstanding guidance throughout the entire process. It was as if they developed a roadmap that we can now follow. They made things so easy. There's no one I would want to take care of us more than these people. Now, before we get too far, let us introduce ourselves. I'm Jenna Franks. I'm one of the attorneys at Steinbacher Goodall and Yurchak. I work primarily out of our state college location. Pictured here is my husband, Josh, our daughter, Ava, and our son, Grayson. Now, to give you a little more background on me, I actually wanted to be an attorney since the eighth grade. At that point, I, I always saw an argument for either side of a situation. So to be honest, I basically drove my parents crazy because I always played the devil's advocate. But at the end of the day, I always knew that I wanted to make a difference. And what better way to make a difference than through the legal system? So we lived in Florida for about 10 years and I practiced in several different areas of law, but to be honest, nothing really spoke to me at that point. Then we got a phone call. Both of our grandparents back in Pennsylvania had been hospitalized and they weren't doing well. We decided it was time to move home and help out. This is Graham and Pat, two of the cutest and sweetest older people that I know. They were married over 60 years. This is one of the last happy pictures that we have of them. Graham ended up being diagnosed with dementia and Pap suffered a stroke that made him very weak. Graham and Pap needed long-term care, but just like most people, they wanted, to stay, they wanted to stay at home as long as possible. Going through this process for my own loved ones, including even living with them for a year, helped me realize how important planning is so that you have more options. And Holly, I know you too have dealt with many of these situations. If you'd like, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, yes. Thank you, Jenna. So my name is Holly Ray and I'm a nurse and I've spent, oh my goodness, almost nearly two decades working with seniors and their families in a variety of capacities, skilled nursing facilities, personal care homes, home health, I was the executive director of a hospice agency, and I came to the firm to help people navigate the healthcare system because we all know that it is complicated and it changes daily. And the next slide is going to show my family. So I am a mom of two boys, and my youngest just got his driver's license. Well, he got his permit last week. So now he wants to drive me everywhere and I'm getting used to that. So I enjoy the outdoors, I enjoy people, I enjoy my family. And I am actually the oldest of 29 grandchildren. I'm the oldest daughter. So I realized caretaking began at a very young age and um, I grew up on a dairy farm. And so my grandmother actually got diagnosed with uh, dementia 
And at that point in time, they really didn't know what dementia was. So I started at a very young age um, learning about dementia and the forgetfulness. And in all reality, I thought that was the normal part of aging. So I didn't realize uh, much later in life that that was a disease. So pictured here, I'm still currently professionally dealing with the dementia, the Alzheimer's diagnosis with the work that I do. But personally, that's my grandfather. And back in May, we celebrated his 93rd birthday. And next to him is my son. So he still currently wakes up every morning at 4 a.m. to go to the barn to milk the cows. And we're still able to currently keep him at home with the support of the programs that are available and families. Every day is a new day and we're constantly getting creative in, in taking care of him. So here we have a sort of a roadmap to dementia. We call it the dementia care journey. And it is something to visually look at. And as you can see, it reminds you of the game of shoots and ladders. You sort of roll the dice and you don't know where you're gonna end up. Some days are better days than others. Sometimes you go up and down. So like, for example, you start and you're living alone or your loved one is living alone and you notice they're getting forgetful. So families are coming in. If there's families available, now people are starting to miss work. You know, there's a doctor visit. At that doctor visit, they may change medications. They may suggest you see a specialist. So it's just constant going. It's, you never know, it's up and down, it's all around. And we all know that this disease gets worse. We know that there's not a cure. It's not gonna get better. There's medications available to slow down the process, but nothing is going to make it go away. So it goes through the journey is just that, you know, there's gonna be falls. There's going to be weight loss. Diet's going to change. Eating is going to change. You're gonna be in and out of the hospital, doctor's visits. And at some point in time, you're gonna need more care. So what does that care look like? Can it be done at home, in a facility? If a facility, what type of facility? So once again, this is just a little bit of a roadmap about the journey of dementia. So what do I do as a dementia planner? Well, I work with families and a person diagnosed with this dementia diagnosis to help set goals. Really, what is your goal? I'm going to listen. What do you want? Where do you want to be? Guide you through the process. Where are we? Do we need doctor's appointments? If we do, what appointments are those? Advocate throughout the system. Be your voice within the hospital, doctor's office, facilities, supports. We provide a lot of support, whether here at the firm, community supports. I'll help you do some research. Is there a different doctor that we need to talk to? Uh, maybe in talking to you and setting goals, I discover that you wanna be in a personal care home and crafts are very important to you. Well, we can do some research to see if there's a facility out there that has a crafting program available or woodworking, woodworking is another popular one. Options that are available, talk to you regarding your plan, financially, what can happen, personally, what do you want to have happen, education. When you have this diagnosis, educate, find out, um, anything that you need to know regarding your, your education. And know that you're not alone in this journey. This is a very emotional um, process. Also spiritually, where are you in your spiritual and religious beliefs? The big item I've seen over my course of years and even professionally is just caregiver burnout, caregiver stress. The person with this disease and diagnosis they're pretty well taken care of because all hands are on deck. But what about that caregiver? Who's looking out for them? Who's taking care of them? Many times we see that that caregiver ends up getting sick. And now we have a bigger crisis because this person that was caring for the one with dementia is no longer able to do so. So what does this look like now? So yes, having dementia or the diagnosis is a difficult process. However, knowledge is power. and um, you have to gain the knowledge now 
And knowledge is only good if you use the knowledge that you gain today. So don't wait, start your research. And this is what we're here to do today. So I'll let Kristen take it over from here. So thanks, Kristen. Thought I was unmuted. So good morning. <laughs> My name's Kristen Dougherty. I am a long-term care planner and a certified Medicaid planner with Steinbacher Get On Your Check. I'm one of the um, few certified Medicaid planners in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm also a certified dementia practitioner and an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care trainer, which allows me to train other professionals in the community to become a certified dementia practitioner. <laughs> I've been with Steinbacher Get On Your Check for 10 years. Prior to that, I was with the Area Agency on Aging for five years. This is my family, uh, my husband, Kyle, our daughter, Kendall, and our son, Kyler. Yes, we all have key names. <laughs> um, yes, our kids are both redheads, and apparently all of our pets are as well, for the most part. We have our Fox Red Lab Chestnut, our cat Sprinkles. They hate each other. They chase each other around our house nonstop. <laughs> And we have horses as well. My daughter's very into 4-H and riding. So we spend a lot of our summer and um, spring and fall <laughs> committed to that. But how did I get here? Well, I like to compare it to Alice in Wonderland. I kind of fell into it. I knew I always wanted to help families. So in college, I went to sociology and psychology. Um, I did take an internship at a drug and alcohol facility, and I knew very quickly that was not a good fit for me. Um, luckily, the Area Agency on Aging was hiring. Um, I applied for the job, got it, and it just was a really good luck because I just loved that job. I loved going to work every day where I could help people. But like many social service agencies, resources, funding, manpower is really limited. So that's how I ended up transitioning to Steinbacher Good On Your Check, where I'm able to go above and beyond every single day doing what I love most, helping families, protecting spouses, and giving the right advice. I work alongside the attorneys to explore options for care, applying for benefits, connecting seniors with resources, and most importantly, advocating for those in need. But the main reason I'm so passionate about what I do is because of being able to help somebody like Nancy. Now, I would love to tell you Nancy's story, but I really think her testimonial says it all. After my husband went to a nursing home, I went to another law firm in the area to see what could be done about paying for his care. They said there was nothing they could do for me and that I'd have to spend down my money for him to then be eligible to receive Medicaid. I was very concerned and felt they just left me on my own. I later was told to call this firm. I figured why not? Because at this point I had nothing left to lose. After explaining my situation, I was told to come in right away because I required immediate attention. What they did for me was unreal, especially after being told I was in a hopeless situation by that other firm. They took action to protect our assets and get my husband's nursing home bills taken care of into the future. Everyone was so wonderful. I'd taken my daughter with me, and when we were told the bills were going to be paid, she cried because she knew what the other lawyer had previously said. I can't say enough about that kind of attention to detail. Now, today isn't about Nancy, though. It isn't about us. Today is about you. Our goal for you today is to make sure you know what you need to do to make sure that you and your loved ones are taken care of during your second half of life. What you're going to discover today, the right information, the discussions you should be having right now, what care options are available and how to pay for care, the value of having good documents and resources and caregiver supports. We're going to take you from where you are right now to where you want to be. And we're gonna start off with Jenna with dementia discussion number one, are my legal documents in good order? Thanks, Kristen. So once you receive a dementia diagnosis, the first thing you should do is make sure that your legal documents are in order. Typically, this includes several powers of attorney and a last will and testament. 
For some people, this might also include a trust. If you guys get nothing else out of this presentation today, please get this one thing. The most important thing you can do to protect yourself right now is to put good powers of attorney in place. A power of attorney is just a written legal document that appoints someone else to be able to make financial and healthcare decisions on your behalf. But why are these so important? Well, let's talk about the risks of not having them. If you don't have powers of attorney and something happens where you're unable to make your own decisions, then your loved ones must seek what's called a legal guardianship. This is basically a court process where the family has to ask a judge to appoint a guardian to be able to make financial and healthcare decisions on your behalf. This process is costly, it's time consuming, and at the end of the day, you lose control because it's up to the judge to appoint who will be making decisions for you. It may or it may not be who you would appoint for yourself. Believe it or not, even your spouse can't automatically step in and make decisions on your behalf. In fact, the state of Pennsylvania assumes that you don't want your spouse to be making financial decisions for you. So by not having a power of attorney, you could really limit what your spouse is able to do with finances. This could even end up impoverishing your spouse at some point. There are several different types of powers of attorney. Our office provides four different powers of attorney, a financial power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, a mental health power of attorney, and a living will. Today, we're not gonna to spend too much time going through the specific types, but there are a few things that we want to note, as, especially as far as that financial power of attorney. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, the financial power of attorney authorizes whoever you want to appoint to make financial decisions on your behalf, basically dealing with bank accounts, handling real estate, really any asset or income that you have, they're able to step in and deal with. Unfortunately, not all powers of attorney are created equal though. Our office tends to see power of attorney documents that don't include everything that's necessary. For instance, if you do have a financial power of attorney right now, check it and make sure that it authorizes your power of attorney to make unlimited gifts and create irrevocable trusts. It cannot just say gifting in general or limited gifting. It can also not say trusts in general. It must say unlimited gifting and irrevocable trust, or your, this power of attorney could really be limited in protecting any of your assets if you end up needing care in the future. Also, if you do have a power of attorney and you signed it before the year 2014, it would be a good idea to have an elder law attorney review it to make sure it still includes everything that it needs. The reason for this is the law changed in 2014. And now the documents have gotten much longer because the law now says if it's not spelled out in that document that your power of attorney is allowed to do something, then they're not allowed to do it. So everything must be spelled out within the document. Nothing's assumed. To give you an idea, our financial power of attorney alone at this point is about 20 pages long. So clearly things have gotten much longer than they used to be. So what do you need to do? get good documents. Do you have the documents that you need? Now is a great time to have any documents that you do have reviewed by an elder law attorney just to make sure that everything is, good, is, in, is in good order. Elder law attorneys are the attorneys that you will deal with for many of your second half of life situations. Some of those second half of life situations that we help with are retirement, planning for care needs, planning for your passing away. So meeting with an elder law attorney to review any current documents that you have in place would really be crucial depending on what might happen in the future. So get good powers of attorney if you don't have them because remember, this avoids putting your family in a bad situation like a guardianship, impoverishment, or even fighting amongst your family members. John and Denise Satzler were in your shoes before they met with us. Afterwards, they said, thank you so very much for the exceptional services. The financial investment we made in your firm is suitable for we now have peace of mind in regards to our estate planning. Mm -hmm. All right, so next we're gonna pass this over to Holly to discuss the, the second discussion you should be having if you or a loved one has a dementia diagnosis. All right, thank you, Jenna. So yes, and sometimes you have this diagnosis, but sometimes you're seeing signs and symptoms. So if you notice that you yourself or a loved one is getting a little forgetful, 
Now, I don't mean just like forgetting um, certain dates, but like a forgetfulness as uh, maybe the keys are put in the freezer. Um, you notice a dent in the car, you know, that that's just little red flags to say, hmm, I wonder what's happening here. So make a doctor's appointment. Dementia cannot be diagnosed in one appointment. It takes a few appointments. You yourself or as a caregiver, start jotting down notes, keep a journal. There's nothing that healthcare professionals like more when you come in with a journal and actual notes and dates and times of what have occurred versus going from the memory if they ask you a question. Well, I think it was in the fall. It was around, no, 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 it was around Halloween. That's not good concrete information. But if you come in with a journal with dates and times, that's very helpful as you start to prepare for a medical diagnosis because with dementia, if you would need long-term care or support in the community, they look at the medical record and they wanna see that there's some type of dementia diagnosis. And dementia is a broad term and underneath, think of it as an umbrella. So dementia is this umbrella and underneath of that umbrella is other forms of dementia, such as Parkinson's, ALS, Alzheimer's, there's over 50 of them. So when I say dementia, that's the broad term of um, other diagnoses. So, and keep a, a journal of your medication as well. For you or your loved one, that's very important. The medication that's being prescribed. Many times uh, you're seeing specialists and specialists talk about one medication and another specialist does something else. Now, uh, pharmacies are getting a little more complicated because there's mail order pharmacies. There's pharmacies that you can go and, and pick up medication. Before it was pretty simple. All the medication came through one pharmacy. And so we depend on, an, on that pharmacist to sort of reconcile the medication and, and keep an eye on things in case there was a conflict, but that's not happening as much. So you have to be your own advocate and uh, create that journal as far as uh, your medication goes. And um, again, just keeping everything in one place. A lot of doctor's offices have now moved to a medical portal, which that's an online version of your medical record. So you can log into that and see your, your tests, your lab results. You can give that information to family and friends so they can log in as well. If there's any type of emergency visits, ER visits, all of that can be listed in your journal as well. Now, the one thing that I caution with is making sure that somebody else has access to that information, or you make sure a family member has that password and login information so they can um, you know, have access to that too. And the one thing too, as Jenna mentioned, if you take anything out of this is making sure that you have long-term planning in place because being a nurse for many years and in facilities, that's the one thing that I really appreciated was having planning in place. I've had worked with patients where they didn't have the proper power of attorneys in place. And I was not able to do certain things or make phone calls because the power of attorney was one, not updated or two, the person that was their power of attorney lived in another state, there was a time zone difference, or they really didn't want them to be the power of attorney and they didn't have their best interests. So making sure you keep those updated and you have people in place that you uh, know that will honor your wishes both financially and medically. Now we are a dementia friendly law firm and you may ask what that is about. So what we do here in the office is if you come into the office, we have made the environment clutter-free. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation too before knowing if there are any triggers for you or your loved ones. So the conference room is clutter-free. We can put on some white noise to so there's not so much commotion um, outside. Also, um, we're able to schedule the other staff members to maybe you know step away from the area. Do we need to reduce the lighting? There are pens that are available. They're like called a Y pen, what makes it a little easier for somebody to sign. 
Uh, there's a, a ramp that's available. If a person has difficulty walking, we can make sure that cars are moved so you can uh, easily come into the building, as well as know that we are able to do on-site visits too. But that's something that we'll talk with you throughout this process to see what's best for you and what you need. So that's a little bit about um, you know, how we become a dementia friendly. And we're all trained here too. There's certain things to say and not to say with a, a person with dementia, like not sneak up behind them and startle them. You, know, you approach them to the front, you make sure that they can see you coming, you use small words. We also have name tags that just say our name that are very large so somebody can um, read our name tags too. We have a support group through the Alzheimer's Association. We are meeting the second Tuesday of every month currently, and this is done via Zoom. And it is from one until two o'clock. Everyone is welcome. Feel free to invite any family, friends, caregivers, neighbors, whoever you think may have value in this support group. This group is a time just to talk, learn, and listen, and to know that you're not alone. Uh, it has been very valuable to people to hear other stories because they realize, wow, this isn't just me. And it's really a humbling experience to sit back and watch how everybody starts helping one another. So all is welcome. That's my email address. And we can get you the, the uh, Zoom to link into the uh, support group. And Kyle has that information too. So once again, that's open to all, everybody, whoever wants to attend our support group. We have lots of resources that are available. We have books. Let us know what books that you, you want. We can have them shipped to you. Some are available online. Um, I have a lot of resources too. Once we talk with you and we know what your needs are, we can tailor the correct resources to you, whether you're a caregiver or somebody that has a disease or diagnosis. We can tailor the resources and the educational pieces to you and what you need most. We also have um, action plans that are avail available. It's a, like a checklist, sort of a to-do list. We can work through that together. I can give that to you on your own. Uh, we have podcasts available on our website. We have a YouTube channel. We're constantly upgrading our channels with information. So feel free to check out our website and um, take a look at those resources. What's nice with that is you can look at look and listen anytime you want. You know, if you're up in the middle of the night, you can log in and listen. You don't have to do it at all at one time either. So every county has an office of aging. So in Center County, they have this, I call it the green book. It's a resource guide. We'll make sure that we, you have that available to you. That can be printed and mailed to you, or you can have it as a downloadable PDF. But it depends on the county that you live in, what resources are available to you. So we work closely with every county in the Office of Aging. So we're going to ask that question, what county do you live in? and we'll make sure that you get the proper information for the county. Sometimes too, the loved one lives in a different county versus family. And there are also times where you're in the middle of uh, moving somebody. So you may be moving between counties. So we'll make sure that you have all the information that's available to you. But once again, if you ever have any questions regarding resources, please call into the office. You can ask for Holly Ray my email address, and we'll make sure that you get the information that you need to make decisions that are best for you and your situation. So we're gonna let Kristen take it over and talk a little bit more about care with dementia. Okay, thank you ladies. So we are gonna round out this morning by talking about um, what care options available and how you pay for that type of care. And you know, this is a really great question. We're really lucky in our area to have a variety of ways to receive care. Care choices range from in-home care to facility care with some options in between. Most of us want to, sit, want to stay home no matter what, 
which of course is great, as long as it's practical and safe. There are agencies that provide in-home care services, or you can also hire individuals to provide that care. If you need some socialization, or your caregiver needs some respite, there are adult day centers that are available to help provide a little additional help so you can stay home. However, at times, in-home care is not enough and facility placement is necessary. Placement options can range from independent living to skilled nursing facilities. Let me share a little bit more about each of these facility options. Personal care homes, otherwise known as senior living communities, are great options for somebody who needs some supports outside of their home. These facilities provide meals, medications, some supervision, ac activities, and some assistance with medical needs, personal care needs, and memory support. Now, these communities can range in cost from anywhere from maybe $3,000 a month to $8,000 a month or sometimes more, depending on the facility and depending on what type of services you need. Now, memory care facilities are a great option for those who have memory impairments, but otherwise are healthy. These facilities focus on memory enhancing activities and therapies, meeting all of their residents' needs while providing a safe and secure environment. Now, skilled nursing facilities are the highest level of care and often have the most medically or cognitively impaired individuals residing there. Now, skilled nursing homes in Pennsylvania cost on average $11,000 a month. That's over $132,000 a year. Continuing care retire retirement communities, CCRCs, that's a mouthful. <laughs> They typically encompass all of the above levels of care, independent living, personal care, and skill. This is a great option for those who would like to age in place. Community, com, continuing care retirement communities generally only accept private pay, and the cost can really range based on the community and the level of care. Many of these communities also have a large buy-in. If you're interested, interested in a continuing care retirement community, it's really important to do your research, visit them and know what it looks like because every one of these really looks a lot different. So how do you pay for care? Well, of course you can pay privately for any type of care you receive. However, as I mentioned, skilled nursing homes are on average $11,000 a month. So you could quickly become impoverished paying for this care out of your pocket. If you are a veteran, a spouse, or a widow of a veteran, you may be eligible for the aid and attendance pension benefit through the Veterans Administration. This can be a benefit of around $2,000 a month if you meet the medical and financial criteria of the program. There's long-term care insurance, which is a great option. Now, every long-term care insurance policy looks very different, so you need to make sure you know what the policy covers if you need care. For instance, what type of care does it cover? Does it cover in-home care? How much is the daily benefit? With the average daily cost of nursing home care over $360 a day, a policy that only pays $100 a day isn't going to be good enough. So let's talk a little bit about Medicare. So Medicare and Medicaid are two very different pro programs. It's kind of like comparing apple to oranges. So I'm gonna provide a little light on the two differences with these programs. Now, most Medicare recipients think that they will receive 100 days of Medicare coverage annually if they move into a nursing home. Unfortunately, that's just not true. Medicare was designed as a short-term solution to nursing home care. It covers up to 100 days annually, the keywords up to. Most individuals only receive around 20 days of coverage. So you can see why it's very important to have other options in place to help pay for your long-term care. 
So lastly, let's talk about Medicaid. Now, as I mentioned, I'm one of the few certified Medicaid planners in Pennsylvania, and I truly could sit here and talk to you about Medicaid all day long, but I'd put you to sleep, and I'm sure, as Kyle mentioned, you want to get out there and enjoy this beautiful day. <laughs> But did you know that most residents in nursing homes are actually covered under Medicaid? And you might be thinking, but wait, isn't Medicaid an impoverishment program? Don't I have to have zero money in my names to qualify for it? Well, yeah, it is actually an impoverishment program, but there are strategies that we can implement to help get you qualified for Medicaid to help protect assets for nursing home care. There's actually even a Medicaid program that pays for care in home. So we talked a little bit about what care options are out there, how to pay for that care, but what happens if you need nursing home care? What can the nursing home take? What can they force you to use to pay for your care? Well, almost everything. This includes bank accounts, CDs, investments, life insurance with cash values, retirement accounts, real estate, pretty much everything you own. And guess what? If you are married, your spouse's assets are available for your care as well. So wait, what are your options? How can you protect your spouse? Well, I'll be honest, here in Pennsylvania, we're, we're pretty lucky. We have some fair spousal impoverishment rules. And in most situations, we can protect almost everything, if not everything, for the spouse that doesn't need care. But, and this is a big but, Jenna talked about this, Holly brought it up again. If you do not have good power of attorney documents and you need care and you do not have the ability to sign powers of attorney, we are stuck. And we potentially could do nothing to protect your assets. There's always the guardianship route, but that might not always make sense. So we got, again, we're backing up. The only thing you get out of today is you have to have good legal documents. We did a really good job. So, but let's, let's come back to this. What about your house? So most of us are really worried about our spouses and our house. What happens if we need care? Most of us, our house is our most valuable asset. So the good news is with proper planning, there are options to protect your house, even if you need care right now. But if you do not put a plan in place and you do not protect your house, the state of Pennsylvania will claim against your house to, to the extent they paid for your care at some point in time, whether it's a claim when you're, um, when you're applying or after you pass away. So how do you protect your assets? Well, every plan is so different. Um, we do not do cookie cutter planning. Every um, you know, person that we work with looks so different. It depends on your goals, your family situation, where you're receiving care, how much care is needed, your assets and your income. There are many, many variables that we need to take into consideration when we are putting a plan in place. I always compare it to a puzzle. We have to put the entire puzzle together to do a good job. If we're missing any pieces at all, you have an incomplete plan. Now, there are many tools that we use to protect assets, but probably the two most people have heard of are irrevocable trust and Medicaid compliant annuities. Now, we're not going to dive into the, to these two tools today, but I will tell you that irrevocable trust and Medicaid compliant annuities or a combination of these two tools are a part of almost every single plan that we put together. Now you might be thinking, but wait, you just mentioned trust, you just mentioned annuities. What about gifts? So you're talking about gifting, how do you qualify for Medicaid? Now that's a great point. And most people um, ask about this. One of the first things they ask us, what about gifting? So there is a five-year look back. It's not three years. It used to be years and years and years ago. It's not seven years. That is a nasty rumor that's been going on for a long time. It is five years. So this is the five-year period prior to your Medicaid application being filed. During this five years, the state of Pennsylvania wants to ensure that you have not gave away any assets for over $500 a month. So again, the Medicaid gifting rules are anything over $500 a month, not 15,000, not 12,000. Those are totally different gifting rules. They deal with taxes. For Medicaid, a gift is anything over $500 a month. Now, if you have made gifts, 
the state's gonna total the gifts and issue a period of an eligibility. But let me clarify something. Just because you've made gifts doesn't mean you necessarily have to wait five years for Medicaid to pay for it. But there's a process and this process must be done perfectly. Everything's very timely if there has been gifts. Let me give you a really quick example. Let's say that you gave away $100,000, a check, uh, cash, a house, whatever it may be. The gift was $100,000 and you need care within five years of making that $100,000 gift. The state's going to say, you are not eligible for Medicaid to pay for your care for nine months. How did we figure that out? We take the $100,000 gift, divide it by the average cost of care in Pennsylvania, which is $11,000, come up with nine. Now, if you have enough money to pay for your care for the next nine months, fine, you've protected that gift, but you're privately paying for that nine month period. But, and this is a huge but, what if you do not have enough money to pay through that penalty? Well, then there's a ton at risk. Not qualifying for Medicaid, not being admitted into a facility because Jenna, Holly and I can sit here and tell you all day long about how long it's taking to get into a facility on a good day. Um, in filial responsibility, which means that your children can be held legally responsible to pay for your nursing home bills. I don't know many people who would want to put their children in that position. Lastly, talking about gifting, I have to mention that we do not recommend outright gifting to anybody even if you love them very much, and even if they are wonderful people. And this really is because of what we call the four Ds, divorce, debt, disability, or death. Let me give you a quick example. You gift that $100,000 to your son and he gets divorced. Well, now his ex-wife could potentially have half. Gift $100,000 to your son and he has creditors. Well, now that's available for his creditors. $100,000 to your son and he has a disability or he becomes disabled and needs benefits. Now we've just jeopardized his plan. Or God forbid, $100,000 to your son and he passes away or a house to your son for $100,000 and he passes away. Does he have a will in place? Where does that house go? What happens next? That's why we use other tools like the irrevocable trust that we briefly mentioned. Now, what if we did not put a plan in place and our loved one needs care right now? Well, this is a great question. I think it's really important to say that even if you need care right now, it's not too late. Okay, let me repeat that. Even if you need care right now, it's not too late. Many families think that once they need care, there's nothing that can be done to protect their selves, their spouses, children's beneficiaries, assets, or income. That's simply not true in most cases. In fact, it's even more important to work with an elder law firm if one spouse needs care and the other doesn't. We would never want the spouse that doesn't need care to worry about becoming impoverished, losing their home, or not being able to pay their bills. Now, when you or a loved one receive a diagnosis, it's scary, it's overwhelming. We don't wanna discuss it with anyone, let alone plan for it, we get it. However, it's important more, it's more important now than ever to plan for what will happen throughout the diagnosis. This is a really difficult time, but we are here to help you navigate through this. As a law firm that focuses on elder law and dementia, we have the knowledge and the expertise to focus on planning for the second half of your life. We don't dabble in other areas of law, like divorces, litigation. We focus on everything you will need for every stage of your second half of life or diagnosis. If you've worked with us in the past, have listened to any of our seminars, I'm sure that you can see, you see, saw or heard how dedicated and passionate we really are about helping our clients. We truly love what we do every single day. This is overwhelming. We threw a ton of information at you today. So what can you do? What are your options? Putting a plan in place. By putting a plan in place, you control what happens if you need care, who makes decisions for you, and ultimately the outcome. Now, as I mentioned, I know this was really overwhelming and probably even a little scary, but think about this. Do you but want somebody else making these decisions for you? Do you want to burden your family by not having the conversation 
or not having a plan in place? Of course not. Let's go back to Nancy. Nancy didn't have a plan. She was told that there was nothing that could be done. She was hopeless and felt like nobody was on her side. Now, thankfully, she had a friend that told her to call us and we were able to jump into action and help her. But what if her friend didn't tell her to call us? She would have lost everything, her house, her income, her assets, and probably even her will to keep moving forward each day. Do you have a friend like Nancy's? Maybe, but maybe not. Do you want to leave it up to chance? Of course not. So what do you have to lose? Think about that for a minute. What do you have to lose? Now, while you think about that, let's recap what we've covered today. What discussions you should have once you receive a dementia diagnosis? What options you have for care and how to pay for care? What happens if you do not have good estate planning documents? And how to reach out to others for help and support. After everything we've talked about today, I hope you get this one thing. Planning ahead is essential to make sure your family is taken care of and you do not spend any more than necessary on long-term care. But how do you make that happen? What is your next step? By scheduling a dementia care strategy session. How does that work? What is a dementia care strategy session? Well, this is a one hour strategy session via Zoom or telephone call or heck, even in person now. <laughs> so during this time together, we will work with you to ensure your estate planning documents are in good order, develop a plan for your second half of life. Plus we will answer all of the questions you have about your unique situation. And at the end of our time together, you will know what documents you need. You will know your options for Alzheimer's and dementia care. Plus, you will have peace of mind knowing that you and your loved ones will be ready for the challenges of tomorrow. At the end of our time together, we will develop a written plan. We will work with you to implement that plan, prepare any and all legal documents, and most importantly, we will walk you through this process from start to finish. Now, you're probably wondering, what does this cost? Well, I'll tell you, for an hour of our time, the value is $495. But because you're here, we know something's intrigued you. There's a reason you're listening today. We are offering this strategy session for free. There is no cost to come and talk with us so we can tell you what you need to be doing or thinking about at this point in time. Okay, so what's the catch? <laughs> Honestly, there's really not a catch. There's the only thing is that right now, Jenna, Holly, and I are scheduling end up almost Thanksgiving, believe it or not. It's crazy. But what we've done is we went through our calendar and we've picked out dates before that, that we have opened up to those that are attending the seminar today to get you in sooner to start working on your plan. So how do you do it? You can, we've made it nice and easy in this day of technology. Kyle's gonna put it in the chat box if he hasn't already. Chat with sgy.com. Chat with Steinbacher, get on your checks. Chat with sgy.com. You can go on there, click on which office you want, William Sport or State College. There are your times and it are available. You click on that, put a little bit of information in, you're on our calendar, nice and easy. Or if you prefer, you can call our office at the number listed here. Remember, by meeting with us, we will review what documents you need. You'll know your options for Alzheimer's and dementia care, and you have peace of mind knowing that you and your loved ones are better prepared for the challenges of tomorrow. All you have to do is go to chat with SGY, click on that link to schedule or call our office. Okay, thank you everybody.